Well, good afternoon and welcome to the homestead. My name is Jonathan. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for episode eight of Porch Talk. I uh, am inside today. I'm actually in the office, which I don't know if I've ever done on Porch Talk, uh, at least not for several years, but the wind is just absolutely uh, taken over outside and uh, it's a little bit too warm for a fire. So we are in the office, in my home office. Uh, so uh, this is where the oftentimes the peace and quiet and the deep thinking happens. Uh, I know some of you are probably thinking, oh, I didn't know he thought deeply. But uh, in fact, I do, and this is where it happens. So uh, you get to join me today in here, and we're just going to take a little bit of time. And I'm going to ask, actually ask you guys uh, to kick things off. What activity do you think is the most dangerous? When you think about extreme danger, you know, maybe you think about extreme sports, maybe you think about trying to solo climb uh, Yosemite, uh, maybe you think about skydiving, maybe you think about, you know, the new the new skydiving, which is like going into like er lower Earth orbit and, and trying to like re-enter the atmosphere in this special suit and all this kind of thing. So... You know, and maybe be on the first man mission to Mars. That probably would be a little bit dangerous, uh, perhaps. So a lot of things come to mind. And uh, the truth is, today, I would like to suggest that the most dangerous thing you can do is to be arrogant. Well, I'll let you think about that for just a minute. Arrogance is a facade. Arrogance lies to us and deceives us and makes us think that we know better, better than God, better than other people, and makes us confident in a way that's false, where we make decisions and we have perhaps an attitude or a way of approaching things that um, is false. It's, just, it's based on an unstable foundation. And today we're going to talk about the dangers of arrogance, uh, what kind of destruction it can do, what kind of destruction it's done historically, as we see in the scriptures. As I look around the world, you know, we all we all watch the news. Uh, we see world leaders making statements, doing things. We see great business leaders and uh, even great people of the faith, pastors and other religious leaders that make statements and and uh, do different things publicly. Um, that uh, that can sometimes be dangerous. They can sometimes not good dangerous, like I'm taking a calculated risk and I'm hoping to do something good, but dangerous in the sense that they have not consulted uh, the, the one, uh, and by the one I mean the Lord, uh, who is the author of all wisdom, the one who directs and guides all things, the one who even though we sometimes don't see him or understand him with our senses, he is the one that directs all things. He is the one that created the universe. He's the one that created uh, each of us. He's the one who has uh, given each of us direction through the course of our lives. Uh, many of us choose to ignore it. We choose to go our own way foolishly. Um, but he is the, the one that is the source or should be the source of, of all things that are good, all things that are wise, and those things that bring prosperity. And when we make decisions, whether we're, it's just us, us commoners, or whether it's uh, someone in leadership who's very visible and, and whose actions affect millions and, and perhaps even billions of people on the earth, uh, then we can see uh, right now, just in the course of our own uh, modern history, we can see that, that there are many consequences to foolish actions that have been taken out of arrogance. Now, this is I don't have anyone in particular in mind. This is not a political discussion today. Uh, it certainly affects politics, but it's not a political discussion. And it's not a, a discussion about uh, this business leader or that, you know, this other uh, church or anything like that. This is just for us to try to understand uh, how dangerous it is to be arrogant. And I think before we can get to that part, we first have to really understand what it means to be arrogant. And uh, I have to be honest with you, I'm uncomfortable with this discussion today because uh, I have a, a great uh, fear uh, of, of being prideful, of being arrogant myself, because part of the, 
the uh, the lie of arrogance is that we believe we aren't being arrogant. We we believe that we're approaching things with humility, or maybe we're not even thinking about it. We're just approaching things, and and maybe with the best of intentions, trying to do the best that we can uh, with whatever the situation is. But we are deceived, and in fact, we uh, we solve or attempt to solve problems and approach problems through arrogance. And something is really interesting. We see in the, the book of James in the New Testament that uh, one of the only clear, uh, of course, we see examples of this all throughout the scriptures, but one of the only clear commands we have regarding this is a very simple statement that God opposes the proud. So uh, do you want to be involved in an endeavor where God is going to oppose you? Well, if you're a Christian and you you believe that God is who he is, then uh, certainly you don't want to. We, we want God to be on our side, or more correctly, we want to be on his side. And, uh, and so I don't think there's too many of us that are just out there trying to be arrogant, but it is a part of the sin nature. It comes out of uh, a desire to exalt ourselves, to uh, become, uh, you know, to raise our station beyond what uh, is appropriate and to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And so it's something I want us to take some time to address today, and I'd like to begin looking at that in Exodus. If you look at Exodus chapter 5, uh, we have the interchange between Moses and Pharaoh. God has come to Moses, and he has told him to go to Pharaoh and to ask him to release all the Israelites who have now become slaves in the land of Egypt, uh, so that they can go out and worship their God, Yahweh. And Pharaoh, very arrogantly, with no fear of the Lord and with no thought of, of uh, how his people and how he was oppressing uh, the Israelites, he simply said, no, no, I won't do that. And so uh, Pharaoh experiences a series of hardships as a result of his hardened heart. And he, and, and they become great plagues, plagues that cause death and destruction all throughout the land. And increasingly, uh, as he goes through these trials, in, instead of responding with humility and backing down and recognizing the power of Yahweh, the power of God, he begins to think more highly of himself that he, in fact, is God. In fact, it is very commonplace for Egyptian pharaohs to perceive themselves and to have their people perceive them as a god. And that, interestingly, uh, actually comes from the time before the flood, the time when um, the, the angels that had rebelled against God that were cast down upon the earth, they uh, called upon uh, the, uh, human, the human beings on, on the earth to worship them. And they made themselves gods. They incited them to gather together in cities. They incited them to build great worship houses to themselves. They... Uh, sacrificed children and 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 caused uh, humanity to do all kinds of evil things. Uh, they intermarried with with uh, the daughters of Eve and 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 created this race of of beings called the Nephilim that were these giants. Um, and it was just just a just a mess, just an absolute mess. And so in that tradition, even though uh, many, most many of many of the Nephilim, I don't know if most is correct, but many of them and were wiped out during the flood when God saved Noah and his three sons and their families. And, uh, but that tradition uh, continued on as, as the, the dark angels. It's, it's unclear what happened to them, but we know that we see in Ephesians that we don't battle against flesh and blood, but against principalities in dark places. So we understand as Christians generally that there is a uh, perhaps a dimension, you might say, of our current reality where uh, there is a war that is going on between uh, the angels that follow God and the angels that rebelled against him. And that's a long and <laughs> an, an intense and detailed story that isn't necessarily the focus of our topic today. But I want, to, want us to take just a little bit, though, and not just read a few verses and, and move on and make a point and move on, but to really try to understand the context so it was not unreasonable for Pharaoh to be deceived and to perceive himself as a god, in fact. And that right there is really kind of the beginning, or not kind of, it is the beginning of the problem for Pharaoh, that he perceived himself more highly 
than he ought to. He perceived himself as greater than he actually was. He didn't recognize his limitations. He didn't recognize the authority that was over him. And he, he let the, and, and this is a temptation that is common to all, all of us, that he let the privileges that he had in his life, the position that he had been granted, he had let it control him instead of him controlling it. And so in a sense, he was a slave to his own arrogance and to his own foolishness. And in the end of, uh, of the story, fast forward uh, through uh, many, many plagues and trials, and finally all of the firstborn in the entire nation of Egypt, except for the Israelites, whom the angel of death had passed over uh, because they had followed God's instructions, uh, had perished. And so it was an absolute, uh, just a disaster and, and took Egypt uh, years, if not centuries, to recover from the devastation that happened because of one man's arrogance and, of course, his advisors and the people that he as associated with, which is an important part of this conversation. We'll get to that in a little while. And so in Exodus, we understand that uh, a nation was destroyed, a great leader was, was uh, brought to his knees, uh, because he refused to humble himself before the Lord. And so that's really our first important takeaway to understand where the error occurred, and we need to look ourselves at how we can avoid that situation. And you might be thinking, well, I'm not a great ruler. I'm not really even a person of influence. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter. But the truth is, it does matter. Between us and the Lord, there needs to be a clear chain of command we need to understand very clearly that when we make a decision to follow Christ, we are making a decision to place him on the throne of our life. And so you can imagine creating, you know, like in the feudal times, you, you have the big throne room or in the Viking age, you had the, the hall where, you know, all the great warriors would come and the, and the, the chieftain of each of the, uh, you know, the Viking clans would, would sit on his throne at the, at the end of the hall and, and, uh, you know, so you can imagine whatever, you know, whatever throne room you can place or are familiar with, but it's the idea that we, instead of us sitting on that throne and we are giving the commands and the orders and the directions, and we're just deciding on our own what, what is to take place in our life, it is where we submit ourselves to, uh, to the Lord. And um, I'm going to, you know, I, let's pause for a minute. We're going to jump over to uh, Galatians, and we're also going to take a look at the book of Jonah. Um, but before we do that, I want, I want you to just pause. We're thinking about, you know, the biblical character of, Fa of Pharaoh and the story of Moses. I want you to think about other world leaders that exist in our world that are sending invading armies into other countries that are, you know, making decisions for their populations, um, teaching false religions, or participating in, in, in all kinds of different things. You know, all, all the decisions and all the destruction that is being wrought on people and all the death and, and terror and lawlessness and evil in the world. And I believe that if you'll, you'll you know, you open up your news app and look at the, the first 10 stories that are listed there, it is probably, with a pretty high degree of certainty, likely the case that someone's arrogance is, is what is causing the hardship and the havoc that's resulting from that. Uh, even simple things in our own legal system with, with how we handle um, you know, uh, uh, what the laws are and deciding what the laws are going to be and how those laws are going to be enforced and, and what's, what is, uh, you know, how our culture determines what is right and what is wrong. There is this, this sense of, of idea that we are in control of our destiny or it's the human race that, that it, where, is where the power lies and it's our intellect, it's our, our ability to uh, you know, have strength and overcome through strength you know, great feats um, throughout history. And of course, there have been great things accomplished by humanity, uh, so that, that's not really in question. The problem is when we are the author of our own uh, direction, that tends to be where things go badly. When a nation, and we can look at you know any example, we can look at the birth of the United States, uh, we can look at the birth of the British Empire, we can look at the, the Roman Empire, when 
they uh, renounced their pagan gods and goddesses and began to worship the one true God. We can look at the Israelites. We can look at the kingdom of Judah. Uh, we can look all throughout history. There is a clear cause and effect that when a nation, uh, just like in our own Pledge of Allegiance, um, e establishes itself under God then that nation tends to prosper and tends to have a time of prosperity for its inhabitants. But when a nation fails to or ignores or becomes apathetic towards that understanding that they are under God, that is when problems uh, seem to occur. And so, you know, whatever, you know, each of us has come to this, uh, this porch talk today with different struggles, problems, thoughts, uh, desires, um, fears, you know, we all, we all are in different places and approach things differently, but we all have in common this struggle with arrogance, this, this struggle with a, with a lie uh, that comes from the enemy, that, and it comes from our flesh, which ultimately is our enemy, um, that, that wants to ex assert itself um, as the commander rather than to trust the Lord and to submit to him. So let's look at another story, and, and we're going to begin to draw some conclusions and to begin to identify uh, in our life, first of all, whether we are living, uh, operating in arrogance or operating humility and how we can know that. But before we do that, let's take a look uh, at the book of Jonah. And I'm going to actually turn over it to it here in my Bible and, and read. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Emetai, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. And preach against it, because their wickedness has confronted me. And that's not an unreasonable request. Jonah was, was a prophet, and the Lord had called him uh, to, to speak his words, and so he was calling upon him. Uh, Jonah had made a decision to uh, be obedient to that. And so it, it's not like this kind of is it came to a surprise, or this would be something that Jonah would have to struggle with or try to understand as a pretty clear direction. But Jonah had a problem. He believed that he was better than the Ninevites. And in fact, he f thought of himself uh, as someone who was, you know, in the, the, in the army of God, quote unquote, on God's side. He felt that because of that, even though it wasn't because of his, you know, own strength or greatness that he was on God's side, it was because of God's uh, grace and mercy to allow him to be. But he began, in, he began to feel arrogant and began to think that God's people were better than everyone else and that the Ninevites who, who performed uh, works of wickedness and evil were unworthy of God's mercy. Even though God had shown him mercy, he was unwilling to be merciful towards others. And so we can kind of see immediately before we even get into the story, um, we can see that immediately we were set up to have a problem. Jonah was, was set up to have a problem. He had kind of created a foundation of trouble, and now he uh, was about to experience the consequences of that. And so he replies, uh, or actually he doesn't reply, he, well he replies with action, his actions, he gets up and he flees to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the Lord's presence. Now, twice there in in uh, in that one verse, and that might be that is a really long verse, might be one of the longest verses in the Bible. Um, twice it says that he fled from the Lord's presence, or he went out from the Lord's presence. So let's talk about that for a minute. Now, obviously, we, uh, or perhaps not obviously, we believe that. Because God is omnipresent, that means that he has the power, the capability, the technology, if you will, uh, to uh, be able to observe and be in all places and understand uh, you know, all things that are happening in any given place at any given time. So if we're looking at this just in a literal sense, there is no place that any of us can go uh, where we can really flee from the Lord's presence. But the, the point here is that he was in the presence of the Lord in the sense that he was right with God. He was in communion with God. He was kind of like when God talked about walking with Adam in the garden. He, he was in the place. He, had, uh, you know, he, he was under God's protection and lordship and leadership. 
And so he had the temptation in his heart. And then, of course, we can all have temptations and temptation is not a sin. It only becomes a sin when we act out on it uh, in, in opposition to God. And that's what uh, the scriptures are trying to help us understand. To, so that when, when it says he left the Lord's presence, it basically is telling us that he left the Lord's communion. He left his protection. He left his his safety. He left his direction. He left. Uh, he walked outside of God's will. A lot of different ways to explain the same thing. So that's what uh, that's what uh, it is trying to help us understand here. And then it says the Lord hurled a violent wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break apart. And the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his God. Okay, so obviously, you know, Jonah he he got on a ship to take him to a place where. Uh, there were, you know, where people worshipped other gods, um, and of course, he, you know, again placed himself in a situation outside of the Lord's presence. And it says uh, so they, because they're, you know, crying out to all of their false gods, and it says they threw the ship's cargo into the sea to lighten the load. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down to the lowest part of the vessel and had stretched out and fallen into a deep sleep. And the captain approached him and said, What are you doing? Sound asleep. Get up. Call out to your God. Maybe this God will consider us and we won't perish. Just kind of a kind of a Hail Mary, you know, kind of a just trying anything you can do in a time of desperation. And so uh, they said, Come on. Uh, the sailor said, Come on, let's cast lots and then we'll know who is to blame for this trouble we're in. So they cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us who, who is to blame for this trouble we're in. What is your business and where are you from? What is your country and what people are you from? And he answered them, I am a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh, the God of the heavens, who made the sea and the dry land. And then the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is this that you've done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. And so they said to him, What should we do to you to calm this sea that's against us? For the sea was getting worse and worse. And he answered them. Now, here's where Jonah, whose story ends pretty positively. All right, This is where the intersection or the road divides where he chose, he took the wise path. In contrast to Pharaoh, who even after repeated opportunities to relent, he refused to submit himself to God's will. Now, in contrast to that, Jonah is about to recognize the error of his way. And this is the, the great picture, the perfect picture for each of us um, as we come into to, uh, to face our lives, to face the decisions in our lives, the people in our lives. And the people part is what gets really hard about this. But he decided that when confronted with the truth, that he would relent, he would humble himself, and that he would, would recognize his arrogance for what it was, sin, rebellion against God, and to turn away from it so that that rebellion and that arrogance did not crush him. And so he says, he says, uh, pick me up and throw me into the sea. So it may quiet down for you, for I know that I am to blame for this violent storm that is against you. All right, now, now let's camp on this. We're in verse 12. Let's, let's camp, or if you're underlining, let's underline this phrase. For I know that I am to blame. For I know that I am to blame. One of the most difficult things for all of us to say in this life is, I'm sorry. Because we tend to, and we tend to see ourselves as more innocent than we are. That's the, the, one of the lies, one of the deceptions of the sin nature, one of the struggles with our own, with the human mind, its ability to comprehend itself objectively. Uh, the Bible says that all the ways man seem right to him. And so we know that our, our initial um, uh, proclivity is to think that we're innocent. And so knowing that is power. And Jonah understood that. He recognized immediately the error of his way, and that he had gone his own way, and he recognized he, there really was no way to truly leave the Lord's presence. He had walked outside of his will, and we have the choice to do that, um, but to our own peril and uh, to, uh, to, our own, to the, own, the consequences that come with that decision. 
And so wisely, uh, he, he humbles himself and then he says, all right, do this. Get me away from you. It's not your fault that this is happening. Uh, throw me off the ship uh, because this is all my fault. And he's just thinking, well, you know, well, I'll, I'll probably, I mean, I don't, I shouldn't say, I don't know what he's thinking, but it sounds like he's probably thinking I'll drown. And, you know, that's just, I made a decision to, to turn away from God and, and we'll let the chips fall where they lie. But he was going to do the right thing first. And that's, that's really the hardest part, but in the first part, the hardest part, and the most important part is to recognize uh, our own arrogance and and to 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 humble ourselves. To and you know I I think I think the hardest part is recognizing it because for most of us, once we recognize it, our healthy fear of the Lord places puts us in a place where we would say, "Yes, Lord, we throw ourselves in your mercy. We we humble ourselves. We realize we've made a mess of this situation." Um, you know, deliver us out of this. Um, uh, you know, how many times have we been in that situation? I, I, I couldn't even count. I couldn't, it would take me days to count how many times I've realized that I have gone in, in my own way and against what God wanted me to do. And sometimes it takes some harsh consequences for me to see that and understand that, sadly. Um, and, and, but yet at the, at that time, how many times have I cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, forgive me. I, it, I, I foolishly made this decision and now I've created a, a problem for myself and I need you to, to help me. I need you to, to, to spare me from the consequences of what I've done. And so we, and so that is really what Jonah does. It says, nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they couldn't because the sea was raging against them. So they called out to the Lord, please, Yahweh, don't let us perish because of this man's life and don't charge us with innocent blood for you God have done just as you pleased then they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea stopped raging and the men feared the Lord even more of course yeah you would it when when immediately the uh, the sea stops raging and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows now the Lord had appointed a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the fish three days and three nights. And of course, we know the story of how he's swallowed by the great fish or the whale, whatever it is. And he spends kind of his time, you know, like the Israelites in the wilderness, uh, you know, like our kids do in time out. And the Lord was merciful to him, uh, I believe, or it, it appears from the story because he humbled himself. Um, I'm not sure that, that God maybe would have spared him. He may have let him, I'm not speaking for God. I'm just trying to assess and understand the story, but I'm not sure that God would have sent the fish, which sounds terrifying, uh, but that's really what saved him, as terrifying as that would be to be swallowed by a whale. I mean, I, I, that would absolutely be, you know, one of my top 10 worst nightmares happening. Uh, and yet the Lord sent that sent that for, to save him for his salvation, that uh, he didn't drown in the in the storm or in the ocean, but but he was saved because um, you know God was going to even though that was going to be a time of hardship and difficulty, he was going to use it to deliver him. And in the end, the whale spits him out to dry land. There's a lot more drama, and he he has some other attitudes and things he's got to work through. But ultimately, he goes to Nineveh. He calls them to repentance. The whole nation repents and turns towards the one true God. And uh, and, a, and a great thing, a great work occurs, and we see the blessing that comes into Jonah's life. We see the blessing that comes into the nation of Nineveh, as a result of one man's decision to humble himself. And that's why it's such a big deal. And you might say, you know, you you've got ten porch talks uh, in a in a spring, and you're going to spend a whole porch talk talking about humility. Well, honestly, guys, as I was praying, thinking about this week and, and what the Lord wanted me to share, and I was waiting and I was waiting and I was waiting, the thing that, that kept coming to me over and over and over was how important it is for the people of God not to forget, not to fall away and worship other gods, you know, the God of 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 trying to be the best, trying to be on top, the God of uh, rushing around and trying to get tons of things done. Uh, the God of, of authority and it's my way or the highway. Uh, you know, there, there are many gods um, that fight for our heart. But the one true God calls us to humility, to decrease ourselves so that he can increase in our lives. And it's through that 
um, that we find prosperity. You know, it'd be just like uh, the the first Mars colonists that they you know they land on the, the red planet and they're setting up their camp and and they're you know figuring out how to grow food and to harvest ice so that they can make oxygen and have water to drink and all these things and and you know it doesn't matter how hard they try. Um, there is only there is a finite amount of resources and there is a finite way to harvest those resources and that you can't just make it happen through uh, you know <laughs> through whatever great uh, you know intellect or ingenuity we think we might have uh, the limitations of physics and the physical universe are always there and so uh, we have to remember that there is one one being that surpasses all of those limitations, and that is the one true God. And if we use him as the source of everything that we try to accomplish in our life, then we will be, as the Bible says, more than conquerors, that we will uh, accomplish great things uh, if our will is aligned with the Lord's. And, but it takes that that step, that posture, that that heart, that intellectual decision of humility, that is the first and foundational part. And you, you cannot grow spiritually, you cannot become great uh, in the kingdom of God without first becoming the greatest servant and, and humbling yourself. And so we, as we think about uh, this story, I want, I want us to look briefly at Galatians. And in the book of Galatians, we have, um, uh, I believe it's chapter 22, uh, let me flip over here, and uh, I'm sure. Sorry, not 22. Uh, maybe I, I say I wrote. I wrote down here. Is it two two? Oh no, it's five five twenty two. That's the part that I was missing. Yeah, I'm like there are not 22 chapters in Galatians. Let me flip to that. Galatians five. Let's see if that's right. 22. Indeed, it is. Where we find the list of the fruits of the spirit. Now, interestingly, it comes right before that. There are verses 19 through 21 that list the work of the works of the flesh. And so we have this contrast. And for some of you, um, you may have, have fought this battle so many times, you could assess right now in three seconds whether you are walking humbly before the Lord and in, in a spirit of humility in your life or whether you are walking arrogantly. And you can identify that quickly, mostly because you have, you have suffered the consequences of arrogance so many times that you, you have become, you have learned to walk softly and to uh, be more thoughtful in your approach to life. Uh, but, but I know there are, there are many, many, and especially if you are uh, not yet, uh, um, have not yet made a decision to follow Christ or you're a, a new believer and, or, or maybe you've been a believer for a long time, but you've never made a decision to really follow Christ. You just kind of made a decision and then you just kind of stopped there and didn't understand there was something more to do. But, but salvation, or, or uh, that's a big churchy word, but our decision to call upon the name of the Lord and to, uh, follow after him begins with a an intentional act of humility that we we call it surrendering but we are basically diminishing uh, in our diminishing our will diminishing our purposes all the things that we've set out to do in our life uh, you know for me I had set out uh, before I really made a decision to follow Christ I'd set out to be a, a computer information systems major and a computer programmer I mean I love technology I love computers and all those things and the information age and and at that time it was just at the dawn of the internet and, and things are really starting to take off in that that realm and I I was excited and I, I mean that was my major in college and I was just you know so excited to pursue that and when I really decided to follow the Lord I realized that he had a different plan for me and that was not being a computer programmer <laughs> that was not being uh, in information systems, although that's become a part of my life, and I've I've been blessed to be able to own some businesses in in that field, but he changed that and and changed my my the direction of my life by telling me that I was going to serve him in ministry, and so uh, whatever that it looks differently for each of us, and and one is not greater or lesser than another. That we're we're all parts of the body. We're all called to do our part, and. And in fact, that calling can change over time. He may call us to a specific place to serve at one season of our life, and then that 
that we, we complete that task and then he changes it. And he, he wants us to grow and experience new things and do different things. And so we can't, we have to be careful not to just get stuck and, and assume that we know what God is calling us to do. And that's a mistake that, you know, that's more in the intermediate advanced uh, category, but that's a mistake that's easy for even the most mature and experienced Christian to make is just to think, oh, I heard from the Lord and he told me to pursue this and do this. And we're just out there doing it. And we've kind of got ahead of God. And then God's like, okay, we're done with this. Now we're going over here. And we're like, oh, no, I'm, you know, and we just, we just stay focused on that, that path. And we pretty soon we get way out in the middle of the desert and we're thirsty and we have no food and we're, we're just absolutely exhausted and famished and about to die in the desert. And we call out to God and say, God, what happened? I thought you called me. I thought I was doing your work. I thought I was doing all the things that you wanted me to do. And then God's, you know, we hear the voice way over here, you know, it's like, well, you kind of left my presence <laughs> like Jonah did. You're way over here in the desert and I'm over here and this is what we're supposed to be working on. And you're working on some other thing you came up with over here. And then we have to reconcile that, right? And this is that crossroads, the crossroads that Pharaoh uh, came up against and the crossroads that Jonah came up against. Pharaoh chose to harden his heart and to ignore the Lord and to go his own way that he thought he knew what was best. After all, he was the God of Egypt. Uh, and and Jonah cho chose to humble himself and to realize, ah, oh, this is all my fault. Throw me into the ocean because this is better for me to, to be killed than for, for everyone on the ship. And, and he recognized, he humbled himself and he recognized the error of his way. And God forgave him and blessed him and continued to use him. And so I want to be clear that, you know, from, from, the, from Jonah's story specifically, we learned that just because you walk outside of God's will for a season, he's not done with you. Uh, there may be, there, there may and, and often will be consequences, and there may be a season of restoration that needs to occur uh, in order for things to be made right between you and him. But oftentimes he gives us a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a one millionth chance um, to follow him so long as we are willing to humble ourselves and recognize um, that, that we were wrong, that we were arrogant, that we thought of ourself and our desires, our comforts and our wills ahead of him. And this really, this really describes, I think, to a great extent, the, the, daily, uh, the, the daily battle of our life, that every day is a battle. And we really aren't battling, as we mentioned before, against flesh and blood. It's not a battle against your boss. It's not a race against the clock. It's not, you know, how much education you can have or how much wealth you can ac accumulate. Uh, because all these things can be taken away from us in a moment. And, uh, and even though we value them all so highly, and I get that. I do too. I, I struggle with all those things. I fight that same battle every day, even though I've been a Christian for <laughs> decades. I, you, you would think I would know better and be better at this point, but I'm just like you. I'm a fellow struggler. I'm trying to learn and understand and grow. And I'm trying to, to humble myself before the Lord and let him guide and lead and, 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 and make all the decisions and, and show the direction of my life. But it's very difficult. And it's something you can't just do once and then just think every day you're going to wake up and have that heart and attitude. It's something that every day, and, and I believe this is why I say almost every episode how important it is for you to have a personal quiet time. Because daily we have to be willing to uh, make a decision to follow Christ and to, to submit every act and thing that we do in our life. And you might say, oh, well, that's good for you. You have time to do that. Well, I have probably the same time constraints and struggles as you do. Um, and yet I recognize that there are things, there is money that I will not make. There are things that I will not accomplish. There is information I will not have because I am deliberately making a chance to lay those opportunities down to be with the Lord. And what I've learned is being with the Lord and surrendering to him and having a moment in my day when I bow down before him and I say, God, you are the Lord of my life. Show me what you want me to do today. I have found, and, and if, if there's a great, if you're looking for that nugget to walk away with today, here it is. I'm, I'm trying to tee it up for you you will be more efficient and effective with your life if God is the one who's directing you. You can be the best time manager on the planet and you will accomplish less and you will waste more time spinning your wheels and being like the hamster in a hamster wheel, spinning around and working hard and getting nowhere 
if you try to do it without the Lord. How do I know this? Well, because I've tried it and failed, and I have come back to understand that my life is better, and that many of the things that I think that I want to accomplish and do, I come to find out at a later time what a waste of time that is, and how unimportant it is, how it, it definitely was not going to bring happiness and joy and peace into my life. And I've learned that sometimes, uh, not sometimes, I've learned that every time, going before the Lord and in, in, enlisting Him as the commander-in-chief of Jonathan House's actions today is the most effective and efficient way uh, to live life. So, so you know what? Try it. Try it. I, I dare you, and you can quote, you can go tell Pastor Scott and anyone else, you can go complain to the Pope. Jonathan dared me on a, on a, in a Bible study. How dare he do that? But I am. I am daring you to try it for 10 days. I am daring you to do nothing in your day until you come before the Lord, have your quiet time, submit your day to him. I dare you to do it for 10 days and you see what happens. Dare you to do it. All right. I believe that if you will do that, you will find that those 10 days are were or are, I guess because we're talking future tense, uh, will, will be the, the 10 best and most effective, life-changing, uh, and, and great days of your life. And in fact, God might absolutely wreck everything, but the foundation that he is going to lay in those 10 days will be really good. And that may be part of the reason why we don't want to do that. We don't, we like our life the way it is. We're comfortable. We like the certainty of what we know. We fear the unknown. We don't really want a new adventure. We don't want things to change. Uh, and yet we all have things in our life that we know need to change. And so we're resisting God, just like Noah or just like Jonah. And we're fleeing from his plan of goodness because we're afraid. We're afraid of what it might mean. And I get that. I get that. In fact, I think that gets worse with age, perhaps. <laughs> uh, I used to be an agent of change. I love change. I was ready for an exciting new adventure. And now I just want to sit on the porch, drink coffee in the morning, tea in the afternoon, uh, and a nice ice cold Dr. Pepper in the evening and uh, enjoy my life without the adventure. <laughs> For me, that's all the adventure. I have all the adventure that I need in my life comes and finds me. Uh, I cannot escape it uh, with all the exciting things that happen at church and within my family and, and uh, such. So uh, I don't seek that out. But I'll, I will dare you to do that. And you can even complain to whomever that I dared you. Uh, to do something, but I believe it will be to your benefit and it will be a good thing. All right, so let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, where it says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And in fact, it goes on to say, against such things, there is no law. In other words, if we accomplish these things, we don't have to worry about being into sin, falling into sin, because we are walking in the Spirit, that we are, we are experiencing the fruit of the Spirit in which we're walking in, uh, for example. Now, in contrast to that, the works of the flesh are obvious. In back, going back in verse 19, sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. I tell you about these things in advance, so as I told you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we know that if that is our default, if that is how we are operating, it's evidence, okay, it's not a salvation decision, right? But it is, it is evidence that we are, we are not in the kingdom of God. Because if we're pursuing, I'm not saying you don't fall into temptation and that you you commit sin and then you you are convicted of that sin and you repent of it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about if you're pursuing it, if you're pursuing idolatry and outbursts of anger and jealousy, and you just and by pursuing it, I'm meaning you're not doing anything in your life to restrain it, right? That's the same thing as pursuing it, right? If you 
If you have a, 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 if you open your front door and put a neon sign that says "Come and steal everything in my house," and you stick it out there, and then you're asleep at night and wonder, well, how come somebody came into your house and stole all your stuff? Well, it's because you open the door and you put a sign out that says "Come and steal stuff," right? So that's what happens in our life. That's the decision that we're making if we don't restrain. That's why we lock our doors. That's why we have security systems. That's why we own firearms is to protect and defend uh, those things that the Lord has entrusted to us. And so if you don't protect and defend your heart uh, with the fruits of the Spirit, then the works of the flesh are by default what will happen. You can take that to the bank, I guarantee you. And I do not dare you to do any of that, right? Don't You don't want to test that. The Bible says, do not put the Lord your God to the test, right? We need to trust him that following after him and living a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things to which there is no law. And so that is the way that we can know we are in the kingdom, not that we're perfect, not that we always have those things, but that's what we're pursuing. That's how we know that we're people of the kingdom because we're pursuing that. We're pursuing peace. If you're if you're someone who goes around and you're always creating trouble and you're you're a contrarian, I mean, it, it can be good to be a contrarian sometimes. But if you're just being a contrarian to be hard to get along with and to be not a peacemaker but a, a violence insider and a and a, and somebody who you know stirs things up, which that and that happens and that's what wrecks a lot of churches then you know that 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 is something that you are uh that you have walked outside of you know the presence of God in Jonah's sense uh like in our story. And so we kind of have and and, and I, I wish we had more time we're we're almost out of time. I wish we could talk about each specific fruit of the spirit and each specific work of the flesh and and talk about them and identify them maybe we'll do that at some point. But what we what is very important for us to recognize today is that if you are operating in the flesh and that your life, that the works of the flesh describes your life more than the fruits of the spirit, then that's how you know that you probably are walking the path of arrogance because you believe that your intellect or your will, your you know personal sovereignty or something is, is greater than God's sovereignty. And it just does not make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that as finite beings that have a short life, that somehow who created nothing, um, that somehow we can know greater than the creator of the universe who, who spoke the world into existence. And we don't know exactly what the Bible means by spoke, but, but something that he did as he spoke, it caused great uh, physical things to occur in the universe and the cosmos. And he set things in motion that are orders of magnitude beyond what we could possibly comprehend. Um, that, that somehow we would do a better job of deciding what we should do in our life than that powerful creator. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You're right. As you're thinking about it, it really doesn't make sense. And yet we wake up, we brush our teeth, drink some coffee, start our day with no thought to God's will or plan, and then wonder why we get ourselves into so much trouble. And if you think I'm talking down to you, you would be wrong because I'm mostly talking to myself. So I'm going to leave you with that challenge. I, I do. I, I challenge you. I dare you for 10 days to lay down your life in favor of God's will and plan. I believe that if you will do that, God will do some amazing things in your life and that your act of humility in that in that sense, but also just in very specific acts of humility, as we come and we humble ourselves before our boss, before our spouse, before our kids, before before uh, anyone and everything and everyone. It doesn't mean we let people walk all over us. It doesn't mean we let them take advantage of us. But if we come approach every situation with a heart and attitude that God is in control, that other people are more important than we are, and that and allow God to elevate us rather than us elevate ourselves, I can guarantee you that you will accomplish greater things. Well, thank you so much for the time uh, that you that we were able to spend together today. I hope this, this has been helpful and a blessing, and I hope that it is very practical and that it is something you can take with you and that even tonight, uh, you it can begin to change your life and transform your life from a life of fear and frustration and doubt to a life of confidence and peace and assurance, knowing that the one who is leading your life, who you have placed in control, will help you land that plane well so that you will run the race of life 
you will finish that that and that journey and as it comes to an end you will come, go to spend eternity with him and you will be able to celebrate all the good things that God has done well, let me pray for you and then we'll be dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that we've had today. And I do pray, Lord, for each of us that you would grant us a spirit of humility, that we would choose to humble ourselves before we get humbled by a hardship in our lives or before you who are uh, a God who is righteous and holy. And Lord, I just pray for these friends and these, these, uh, these dear brothers and sisters today, Lord, that you would give them strength that you give them the humility, give each of us humility that we lack, Lord. If our own arrogance is so strong that we just can't seem to do it, I pray that you would have mercy on us, have mercy on our sin, have compassion on our wayward heart. Lord, draw us to you. Lord, lead us to the good pasture. Lead us to the green pastures that we see in the Psalms, Lord, uh, where there is peace and where there is joy and where there is prosperity. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we've had to, to, to know you and to study your word today. And we pray, Lord, that it would not return void and that we'd do a great work in our lives. We just thank you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, be blessed. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Thursday at 4 p.m.